So uh, I'm not going to, to waste any time. I'm gonna get right, right to it. All right, so I'm sharing my screen now so that we are able to uh, follow along uh, with me. And so this morning, uh, as we've been talking about this month, our theme for this month is Contagious Christianity, Discipleship in a Pandemic. And last week, we got off to a great start with Elder Russell reminding us about the benefit of being lost. He said that the fact that we realize, when we realize that we're lost, that's when we can allow the Holy Spirit to come into our life and actually have the Lord save us and come into a, a, a true understanding of what it is to have a relationship with God. And it's through uh, realizing that we, we need it to be saved, you know? And so looking at this idea of uh, how COVID-19 has spread all over the world uh, in, in, a, in a short time, it got us to thinking about how can we pass on, how can we pass on the love of God? How can we pass on the gospel as quickly and as, as seems like so easily that COVID was able to go across the globe in a matter of time, you know? Uh, these are some questions that we, that we posed on last week that I wanna put in your mind before we get in our text this morning. Uh, are you infecting those within your reach? If you're contagious, if you're a contagious Christian, do, do, does your coworker know? Does your neighbor know? Does your family members know uh, that you are contagious? Do they know that you have uh, the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you and that they are in close proximity with a life-changing force? Uh, how, it says, the second question, does what you have on the inside come out when you talk? The Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart? Are you contagious? Is the Holy Spirit spilling out in your conversation? Uh, is what you talk about uh, uh, leading individuals to question uh, their salvation and if they need a savior, uh, a, a savior in the, in the form of Jesus Christ? It says, are you aware, our last question, that you may be contaminating the environment around you without even realizing it, walking around, infecting others, you know, asymptomatic, not realizing that you have uh, been contaminated. And so as Christians, as Christians, we have the ability to go about our day and contaminate or infect or, or transmit this love that we have for God to others as we come in contact with them. And so today we want to talk about it. We want to get right into it. The title of my sermon this morning is Back to business as usual, back to business as usual. And we'll find our text this morning in John chapter 21, verses one through 17. Now, um, you know me, I love to teach. I love to, the love to teach the Bible. When I get really excited, I talk real fast. So if you have a pen and paper near you, if you have your Bible open this morning, it's gonna help you to take away something from this uh, lesson, again, like I said, I try my best to slow down and not get too excited when I'm teaching, but it's, this is so powerful this morning that I don't want you to miss an opportunity. So I'll give you about five seconds to get a pen and paper because I know how it is when those screens are black, that means that you've got kids running around, that means you're trying to fix the breakfast and you're trying to do these things all while listening to service, but this is the time that you ought to sit down, to park it, to get your pen and paper, because I do believe that the, word, the Lord has a, a word for you this morning as it relates to being a contagious Christian, a contagious Christian. I saw Sister Lewis walk away. She's probably coming back, but while she's away, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read uh, our text together. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we come right now just thanking you, thanking you, thanking you for another opportunity to open up your word together. We believe, God, that you called us in these last days to be contagious Christians. As the world around us is dealing with a pandemic, Lord, you're, you're, you're instructing us on how to lead individuals into a closer, deeper relationship with you. Lord, in, despite the social distancing uh, parameters put on us by our government, Lord, we believe that we can uh, pass on our love for you just by simple conversation, just through a text message, just through a phone call, even through an online Zoom service, Lord, we believe your Holy Spirit will work and move in our life. And so God, we welcome in right now your spirit 
to be with us as we study. We remove any distractions in the room. Lord, give us a strong Wi-Fi connection. Help us, Lord, to mute our mics or whatever we need to do so that someone who is listening might be helped by what is shared today. God, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I know you. I can't hear you, but I heard you say amen. We're going to get right into our text this morning. Uh, back to business as usual. Back to business as usual. Let's look at the text. It says John chapter 21. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and, the, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Verse seven, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but also 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. And then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish with you, which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 130, 130. 53. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dare ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. And this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to Jesus showed himself to Simon Peter. And Simon, son of Jonah, he says, <clears throat> do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. All right. I know that those are a lot of scriptures, but we are a Bible reading church, a Bible believing church. And we're going to go through these uh, scriptures today and kind of just excavate the text, kind of pull those nuggets out that I believe will help us to answer our big question. Our big question this morning is, how can I become a contagious Christian? And the answer is my sermon in a sentence. The answer is my sermon in a sentence. It says, we must spread the love of God so that our family, friends, and neighbors may come to Christ while they still have time. All right, my big question, how can I become a contagious Christian? The answer, we must spread the love of God so that our family, friends, and neighbors may come to Christ while they still have time. All right, I want to give you a preview. You know that I always preview my sermon for you so that you know what I'm going to say before I even get there so we can shout together as we, as we read the Bible this morning. So my sermon, Back to Business as Usual, the first thing that I see, I always say if I were on Sesame Street, this morning, if I was on Sesame Street, the letter would be, of the day would be R, all right? That's all my points start with the letter R that helps you to remember them. And it says, the first one, the first thing I see in this text is a retreat. The second thing I see in this text is a reminder. The third thing I see is a reinstatement. 
And after we consider these three points, we'll have a reason to rejoice. Amen. A reason to rejoice. So let's jump in. Just the, all my preliminary is over. It's preaching time. All right. So I'm, I'm going to take my time this morning and help you to see some things that I noticed in this text. The first thing when I, when that first R, the first R, the first point I, I see, the first thing I see in verses three through four is a retreat. How do you see a retreat, Elder Kelly? This is what I see. Consider Peter's resume, shall we? Think about who this was who had decided that he was going to go back to fishing. Let's read it in the text. It says that um, the disciples were together and Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. And then they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Look at Peter's resume. This was Jesus had just died. And we know that when Jesus was, was living, that he was going about from uh, all over the countryside, performing miracles in the lives of, his, uh, of the people of that area. And the disciples were right there with him. They had front row seats. They saw him in action. But, but once Jesus died, these disciples decided to go back to business as usual. I, I got to let that sink in for a minute because some of us, some of us, some of us, instead of spreading the love of God, we've created comfort zones, comfort zones of complacency, conformity, and convenience. Look at, look at Peter's resume. Peter walked on water. If there was anybody who should have been about God's business, even while Christ was dead, while he, even though he had, he had died, who, if there was anybody that should have still been about the mission, it should have been Peter. Because Peter, remember his confession at, at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked, who do the people say that I am? And he said, you are the son of the living God. And, and Jesus said to him, no one but the Spirit of God could have revealed that to you. And on this rock, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This was Peter's resume. Jesus knew who, Peter knew who Jesus was. He had the faith enough to walk on water. He was even there when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Trans. On the Mount of Transfiguration, he, he saw Moses and he saw Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter had a good resume. Sounds like some of us who've been in Adventism all our life, two, three generations in, in Adventism. You, you know, the, you know the, the, the spirit of prophecy. You, you, know that, you know you have the truth. You know how to teach the 2800-day prophecy. You know all about the three angels' message. You have the resume but you lack the power. I'm going to let that sink in right there. Uh, we, 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 we have the truth, but we live a lie. If you can't say amen, say ouch. We, we have the truth, but we live a lie. And you remember Peter? Remember Peter? Peter is messed up, y'all. Peter's messed up because what he did, what he did uh, Jesus said, you know what, so you roll, Peter. I know that you, 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 uh, you, you, you're talking real bold right now, but he said to him, get behind me, Satan. He said, why did he tell me to get behind me? He said, Lord, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, let me, let me check you before you wreck yourself. You're going to deny me before the rooster crows. You're going to deny me three times. And Peter was warming himself at the wrong fire. The, the girl says to him, and I, I don't want to take you through all the scripture. It's a lot of scripture. I, I could take you there, but you'll have to read it on your own. The, the girl says to him, weren't you, aren't you a Galilean? Weren't you one of the ones that walked with Jesus? And, and Peter got cussing mad when she asked him, read your Bible. He got cussing mad when she confronted him about this, about this, was he a part of the 12? He cussed her out and said, I am not the person you think I am. And at that moment, he locked eyes with Jesus as he was being drugged from, uh, from, uh, from courthouse to courthouse and, and, and the rooster crowed and the, and the promise that he made to Jesus came back to his mind. 
that I would not deny you. And yet he denied him three times before the rooster crows. So, so Peter was dealing with some, 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 some stuff right here. He, he was feeling a little guilty. Jesus was dead and now he was going back to business as usual. Despite his, his impeccable resume, and, and, and despite Peter was in full retreat, Peter was in full retreat. When the going gets tough, the weak get comfortable. When the going gets tough, the weak get comfortable. I, I, it's tight, but it's right. I know I got I to gotta go through here. I'm going to give you a little hope. I'm not going to leave you messed up like this, but, but I have to let you know what Peter was dealing with. When he said out loud, he said, I'm going to go back to fishing. It, it, it's been fun. We've seen some miracles, but I'm going back to my comfort zone. I'm going back to what I do best. I'm going back to just sitting around and, and twiddling my thumb. I'm going back to fishing. And many of us, many of us, God has called us. God has, has given us an assignment. And, and COVID-19 came and we then threw our whole church calendar in the trash. There are responsibilities that you have that the Lord has for you, that the Lord has assigned you to, to our third world community, to, to the world around you, to your sphere of influence. But COVID-19 told you to sit down and social distance, and that's exactly what you did. That's smart. I'm not telling you not to take precaution. I'm not telling you not to, to do your best to stay healthy, but I am telling you, do not forget the mission that God assigned you to. Because instead of, again, instead of spreading the love of God, we've created a comfort zone for ourselves where it's okay to, to, to just do, you know, to do nothing because we, we, we can't go nowhere anyway. We, we can't have our programs at the church anyway. We might as well sit down like a, a bump on a log. But that is not the God we serve and that is not what he's calling us to right now. He, he, Peter wanted to re retreat. He wanted to return to what was comfortable to him. And, and what happened when he went on this trip? Let's, let's, let's look at the text. What happened when he went on this trip? The Bible says he went, he said, I'm going fishing. And then he said, and they said to him, we'll go with you. Uh-oh. We're talking about discipleship, right? So Peter had enough influence that when he stopped doing for God, when, when he wanted to hang up his ministry shoes and, and go get his fishing rod, he was able to bring his sphere of influence with him. Uh, I know, I, I wish I could hear you. I wish I could, I wish y'all could shout with me, but I'm trying to tell you, Peter wanted to, he was in full out retreat and he was retreating and what, when he sat down, a whole bunch of other folks sat down with him. Mercy. You, you might've been faithful, you know, you might've been faithful before COVID. You might have been, you might have been, well, oh, let me, let me, oh, ah, well, you know, somebody told me not to hold anything back, you know what I mean? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold anything back. So, so maybe you were real active. My God, please help me, Jesus. You, maybe you were real active when Pastor Williams was in charge. Oh man, oh, ouch. Maybe you, maybe you would have ran through a brick wall for Pastor Williams. Oh, watch it. Oh my God, I shouldn't say this. Maybe you would have driven as far as if William say go look, hey man, that's my boy. I'm going with William, and you go. But 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 now there is a, a new pastor in town. Mercy, ouch! He said to tell it like it was. I, I hate to do this to you. It hurt me too. And there's a new a new pastor in town, and now my arms are folded. Now all my bright ideas, I keep them to myself. Now all my money that I, that I was just, you know, throwing at every program, I, I'm going to hold that to myself. All the things that I was doing to advance the gospel, to bring individuals together, to serve the community, now I, I don't want to do it no more because Jesus is dead. Mercy! <laughs> Jesus is dead. And, and now I'm back to business as usual, back to sitting uh, 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 like a bump on the lawn. And so here he was supposed to be the leader of these disciples. And he was leading them into a blank trip because the Bible says that they caught nothing. <laughs> and remember, remember, they caught nothing. And so 
continuing, one thing I want to point out to you, this Peter's responsibility. Remember, he should have been advancing the gospel. He should have been continuing to do the work that Jesus had started in his three-year ministry. But he was in full-out retreat mode. He had gone back to business as usual. And how many times have we squandered opportunities in the name of comfort, in the name of convenience? Hey, that's going, you mean I got to drive all the way to the north side to give a Bible study? Well, well, man, you might need to find you another, another elder that's in that area because I can't go. But God assigned you that, that soul. I, I just, you know, I mean, I don't know. I try to pass somebody off too. So I'm talking about myself, all right? I'm talking about myself right now. You know, what I, mean? I live on the south side. I can't go to the north side to do a Bible study. I just can't. But, but God said, I called you and I've appointed you and I've, I've anointed you for work and you're sitting on your hands. I'm going to let it sink in because I talk too fast. If you aren't advancing, I, I'm going to use a military term, all right? I, I've never, I never served in the military, but I've learned about retreat. The word retreat means you're running from the enemy, all right? So you are in full sprint mode from the enemy right now. If you are not advancing the gospel, you are in retreat. If you aren't preparing to advance the gospel, you are preparing to retreat. I, okay, it's tight, but it's right. Okay, it's tight, but it's right. It's tight, but it's right. So, 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 what did Jesus do? All right, because because I, I I just beat you up because I beat myself up. This tore me up when I was looking at it. All right, it tore me up. So, so, what did Jesus do now? He sees Jesus. Peter sees. John says, "Let's look at the text." But when the morning had now come. Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He was standing on the shore. Jesus is in the midst, but we can't see Jesus because we're so, we're in our comfort zone so tough. We're complacent. We're conforming. We can, everything's so convenient. We can't even see Jesus in the, in the business. We, we're having board meetings. Ouch. And we're, we're doing more kumbaya and emotional healing in the, in the board meeting than we are doing evangelism. I, I, it's tight, but it's right. We're doing more ego stroking than we're doing evangelism because it's more comfortable for me to do this than to really plan an evangelistic effort. All right, okay. You're talking about being contagious Christmas, uh, Christians, Kelly. Stay on task, all right? So what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? How did Jesus help us? We got a reminder in the text, a reminder, all right? How did Jesus help us? Look at verse five. Jesus, I love Jesus in this text because Jesus gives us a reminder. And what did he remind us of? Do you remember the last time Jesus performed this miracle? I'll read the text and then I'll let you, I'll, I want you to be thinking about when did the last time did Jesus do this miracle, all right? So, Verse five, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, dragging a net with fish. I'm going to pause right there, verse 8. Jesus performed this miracle before. Remember, it was the, the great catch, and it was this great catch of fish that was the beginning of Peter, James, and John's ministry. It's after this moment that Jesus performed this miracle of the great catch that he called them to become fishers of men. And so Jesus knew that Peter was in full out retreat mode. He knew that Peter was going back to business as usual. And Jesus said, before you give up on my calling, before you quit my ministry, before you give up on the work, on finishing the work, I have a reminder. Do you remember when you were, when I called you? 
Do you remember when I called you to this thing? Do you remember the excitement you had when you on this, when you pulled those fish out of that sea? And the, they said it was so, so many fish that both boats began to sink that the nets broke. You remember that? I, that was me. And I'm here again, standing on the shore, beckoning you to come. So Jesus gives him this reminder, and I want to give you the same reminder. I put it down here, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is our great commission. And it tells us, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. We must be if we're going to be contagious Christians, if we're going to be contagious Christians, we must be, we must be mission minded. We must be mission minded. And that mission, by mission minded, I mean that we must be focused on the global mission that God has called us to, that three angels message that we should be about his business on a global scale, looking to teach all nations. Amen all nations. That means people that don't look like us. That's why I thank God for my pa pastor colleague and, and brother Farr, who, who didn't mind coming and sharing and worshiping with us this morning, because they realized that this thing isn't about skin color, or it, it, it's, about, it's about a global mission that God has to bring light into a dark world. Amen. And so this mission minded, this mission minded, we must be about the Great Commission. That's the first reminder. A contagion Christian realizes their role in the global mission. All right? Secondly, Christ reminds us that we ought to be ministry focused. What does ministry mean? Ministry means simply meeting the need. All right? And so the needs that we have in the third ward community are going to be different than the needs they have, let's say, uh, in the Rio Grande down there by the border, you know? Third Ward Houston issues are probably going to be a little bit different than the border down by the border in the Rio Grande Valley, their issues, right? So, so what, I'm, what Christ is reminding us is not only must we be globally minded as contagious Christians, but we must be locally minded. We must have a local focus. We must look at our community and say, what is the need that we can meet here in our community? For a long time, our food pantry has been meeting that need in our community. So that's why I love Berean. I mean, that's one thing that brought me to Berean was their desire to be a, 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 a make an impact in their local community. And, and the, what the work that we have done as a church is a blessing to our community. And that's because we have a global mission. We understand the global mission and our part in local ministry. All right. So Jesus reminds them of this great, this great, this great catch. And it says a contagion Christian puts their energy into the meeting the needs of those within their reach. So the question today is how can I become a, a contagious Christian? All right. I must understand that I have to leave my comfort zone and allow God to motivate me by his love to do his work. And finally, we see a manifestation of his promises, all right? Let's look at this text one more time. Look at, look, just look in, looking at uh, our, our Great Commission, uh, many of you probably have heard me say this before, but we don't get the low of the Great Commission until we do the go. It's a conditional, conditional promise right there. He says, go ye therefore, teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always. I don't, get the, I don't get the low, the blessing that he will always be with me until I start going for him, amen? But there is something, I know that we are Bereanites, I know that we study the Bible, we ring out the text, and there is something that caught my, in, my, 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 my attention in these last few verses of, uh, of this point here, all right? So uh, I'm, at, I'm at point number nine, at verse number nine, verse number nine in chapter 21. Let's read it together. It says, then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 
153, and although there were so many, the net was not break broken. I'm going to pause right here. First thing I want you to rec recognize in verse number nine, it says, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. What this shows me is that Jesus does not need us to catch fish. Jesus does not need us to catch fish. <laughs> if you look at verse nine, there's fish already laid on the fire. Jesus does not need us, but he, 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 he desires that we would want to join him in the, in, the, in the bringing of the salvation of the world. He wants us to be co-laborers with him. He doesn't need us, but he has empowered us to do for him in the last days only what we can do, and that is model his love for a dying world. Amen? And so we see the manifestation of his promises come to fruition in this text because it says in verse 11, Simon Peter went and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And that number stood out to me. That number stood out to me, 153, 153. That number stood out to me. And it stood out to me because the number 153 represents during the time of Christ, there were 153 distinct nations of the world. There were 153 distinct nations of the world during that time. So Jesus was using this miracle to remind Peter that I've called you to the world. I've called you to teach all nations. What are you doing? Wasting your time in the Sea of Galilee. I've called you to the world. What, what are you doing? Wasting your time arguing about meaningless things when I've called you to save the world. This is what Jesus was doing here. He was reminding them. And he says, I have this, uh, not this 135. I'm going to break it down for you, all right? The gospel is beautiful. The gospel is beautiful. And in Romans 8, 35 through 39, I want to read a passage of scripture for you that will help you to understand how just how beautiful our Sabbath school lesson and our sermon today ties together, all right? It says, Romans 8, 35 through 39. There are 17 things. How many did I say? 17 that cannot separate us from the love of God. 17 things, right? I'm going to read them for you. All 17. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul names 17 things that cannot separate us from the love of God. So there are 17 things that can't separate us from the love of God, and there are nine fruit of the Spirit. 17 things that can't separate us from the love of God, and there are nine fruit of the Spirit, nine fruit that develop in us, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, self-control. You know, the, there, are nine, <clears throat> there are nine things that cannot separate us. 17 times nine equals... 153, when we have these 17, when we have the gospel in our heart and in our life, acting, actively keeping, keeping us focused on his call, the Holy Spirit working on the inside of us, all nine fruit represented in our life, these 17 things that can't separate us from our love will help us to save the world to Christ, to bring the world back into relationship with Christ. That blew my mind. I, I, that blew my mind when I, when I came across that, that 153 and how significant it is to us as, at, 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 in these last days. So it's important that we invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts as we talked about this morning in Sabbath school. 
that we invite him in our heart so that he can begin, begin to produce the character in us so that we can finish the work. This is the reminder that Jesus had for us. So not only did I see a retreat in verses three and four, not only do I see a reminder in verses five through 14, I, I also see, finally, I see <clears throat> a reinstatement. I see a reinstatement. And so a contagious Christian draws strength from the promises of God which results in the salvation of the world around them, all right? I'm going to say that one more time. A, a, a contagious Christian draws strength from the promises of God, which results in the salvation of the world around them, all right? Now I see a reinstatement. Let's look in the text, and I'm done here. I'm done here. Let's look in the text. Let me get there because I didn't turn my Bible. Got all excited. Turn my Bible. All right. <clears throat> Reinstatement. John 21, 15 through 17 says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So this morning, I hope that you have had some shortcomings. I hope that you like Peter, have resulted to tuck yourself away in your comfort zone. <clears throat> I hope that you have. Because if you have at any point <clears throat> decided that you were going to kind of back off from this ministry thing, that maybe God didn't call you <clears throat> to lead out in this way, I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking, but maybe you had some guilt like Peter, Peter felt guilty because he had denied the Lord three times and, and, and Jesus was right about him. And, and he, he felt guilty, so he, he wanted to go back to his comfort zone and get away. But I'm, I, I thank God for Jesus because Jesus will not leave us alone. Jesus will not let us go quietly. He will not let us tuck our head in the sand. Jesus will continue to come to us through sermons, through lessons, through Sabbath school lessons, through, through any means necessary to get our attention. And he came to Peter on this seashore this day, on, on this seashore this day to reinstate him, to, to invite him back into service and back, invite him back into the gospel mission. And that's exactly what he did in posing this question. He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? What Jesus was giving us was he was giving us the key to becoming a contagious Christian. He said, he said, Peter, do you agape me? Which means, Peter, do you unconditionally love me? Unconditional love for God is what creates that contagious spirit on the inside. Amen? Our unconditional love for God is what motivates us to save someone else. Because we love God unconditionally and we've seen his promises at work in our life. It makes us want to talk to somebody else. All right, we must share the love of God with the mature and immature in both word and deed. That's what he meant. So Jesus was saying, do you unconditionally love me? And Peter kept saying to God, to, back to Jesus, Jesus, you know that I phileo love you. You know that I brother, brotherly love you. Because, you know, I, I, I messed up the last time and, I, and I, I swore that I would never deny you. And you saw how that worked out. So I can't tell you, Jesus, that I unconditionally love you. But Lord, I, I want to. I brotherly love you. And Jesus asked him again. He says, if you unconditionally, he said, feed my sheep. He said, feed my, feed my lambs. That's what he said. And so I, I want to take close attention to why did he say lambs in one verse and then sheep in the next verse? What it led me to believe is that there are going to be some immature folk that you're going to have to, to teach. 
that you're going to have to show God's love to. And just because age ain't nothing but a number, okay? Age does not denote spiritual maturity, amen? Amen? <laughs> just because I've been in the church for 52 years and I'm one, uh, you know, I'm, I'm been on the motherboard and the usher board and the deacon board and all these boards all my life, that does not mean that I'm spiritually mature. You could just be really good at going to church. You could be really good at getting dressed up on Sabbath. Yeah, I don't know. But 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 you that does not denote spiritual maturity. And so Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, I got an assignment for you, but I'm gonna need you to unconditionally love me because when you unconditionally love me, I know that you're gonna unconditionally love those immature folk. It's tight, but it's right. I, somebody told me not to hold it back today, and I'm sorry. I had, to, I, I, I had some Epsom salt in the house. I'll send it to you for your toes because you're going to need to soak your feet after this because I had to soak mine all week long, all right? He said, there are some immature people that I'm calling you to, but you cannot love them the way they need to be loved if you loving them, uh, 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 if your love is hot and cold. Your love has to be unconditional. And he says, do you unconditional love me, Peter? Feed my lambs. Then he says it again. He says, do you unconditionally love me, Peter? Peter says, I brotherly love you. He says, tend to my sheep. So not only must we teach the immature, we must lead the mature. So what does that require? That requires unconditional love. And then, then Jesus asks him a third time. And he asks him a third time. This time, Jesus changes the wording. He does not say unconditional love. He says, Peter, do you brotherly love me? And Jesus, and then Paul says, Jesus, why do you keep asking me this? You know I brotherly love you. And then he says, um, he says, what did he say? He said, feed my sheep. So what did Jesus show us in this changing of the verbiage? Jesus says, I'm willing to meet you where you are, Peter. Because I know you have a desire to love me unconditionally. You're just not there yet. So even though you have not fully accepted the responsibility that I'm putting on your lap, I know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will become able to lead my sheep. And that's what I see in this text. That's what I see in this text. And, 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 and I really, that's my sermon. And I wanted to help you today to be encouraged that even though you might be in full retreat, remember, if you're not advancing the gospel, you're retreating. So if you, you might have been in full retreat, but God wanted to remind you today of the call that he has on your life, the call to a global mission, a call to a local ministry. He, he, he's called you and, he, and he's reinstating you today. If, if you've ever felt like God doesn't love you anymore, he's telling you, I unconditionally love you. And now I need you to unconditionally love those who are within your reach. So I have a reason to rejoice now that I've heard this sermon. I have a reason to rejoice now because I find my value, I find my victory, and I find my vision in this text right here, John 3, 16 tells me, for God so loved the world, I'm valued. He, he says that, he, he, Jesus says that you were, you, he thought you were to die for. He, came, he loves you so much that he's willing to die for you. You have value. You have value. You're valuable to him. He needs you in this. He wants you in this. He wants you to co-labor with him. He could do it alone, but he wants you to work with him because he loves you so much that he wants you to show the world that love. And then it says, he gave, he, we, have our value in, we have our value in the gospel, but we also find our victory in the gospel because it says that we get our victory from this death, this death that Christ died on the cross. Why did Jesus have to die? Because he had to bear our sins that we might be able to now bear his righteousness. Amen. So we get the victory over sin through what happened at Calvary. I got to teach and preach this morning. I got to teach and preach this morning. But our, we have our value in the gospel. We find our victory in the gospel. And now we have our vision. We get our vision in the gospel because it says, and he shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now my eyes are fixed on those pearly gates. My eyes are fixed 
on those golden streets. My eyes are fixed on that day when Christ will return and I will meet him in the, in the air. I have vision now. I have perspective now because I had the gospel has taken over my life. I've got value in him. I've gotten the victory in him. And now I've got a, a eternal vision. I can see myself standing on the sea of glass, looking at my savior face to face. I cannot wait for that day. And I pray that you too find in yourself a desire not to go back to business as usual, but to be about God's mission. Amen. Sister Amen. White tells us in the desire of ages, she tells us, she says, uh, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we may be treated as he deserves mercy. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. By his stripes, we are healed. We are healed of our sin sick ways, and now, now we can become contagious Christians. Amen. So, my appeal is simple Can God trust you to be contagious in quarantine? I got my mask here, put my mask on. Because what, what I've realized is I used to see people with these masks on. And the first thing I would say is, woo wee, what's wrong with them? You know what I mean? But now everybody got a mask on and it means that we love each other, right? That we're gonna protect people from getting sick. But, but I wanna remind you today that if you wanna be contagious, you gotta take the mask off. If you wanna be contagious, if you want what's on the inside to come out and infect those around you, you gotta take the mask off. And so many of us, we, we're walking around with these masks on. Masks that know the truth, but deny the power thereof. Mask that, a mask of guilt. I, I, I messed up, I sinned some way, in some, in some horrible way. Maybe, I did something that, that I can't forgive myself for. And I, I'm wearing a mask and I call myself a Christian, but can't nobody get what I got because I got my mask on. Can't nobody get what I have on the inside of me because I, I got my mask of unforgiveness on, mercy. My, my mask of unforgiveness on, I, I can't forgive nobody. And so what God has on the inside of me can't get out because I, I've got my mask on. A mask of ignorance. I just want to be wrong. I, I just want, I'm just going to be ignorant. I don't want to know any better. I'm going to keep my mask on. I'm, 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 I'm urging you today to give your heart to God, to, to, to fully give your heart to God and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to produce in you that fruit and that, have the gospel message make you an, 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 a contagious Christian. Because when you fall in love with God, when you unconditionally love God, that means I'll do whatever you have me to do. He says, if you love me, Keep my commandments. And, and he told me not to hold anything back. And I know I might have some family and friends watching. And I, and I just got to talk about the Sabbath. I know I know y'all didn't come on here. Y'all just came on here to support your cousin, your, your, your brother. You didn't want to hear about the Sabbath. But I got to tell you, you know, I got to tell you about the Sabbath. It, it, it's simple. You know, he says, if you love me, unconditionally love me, God. I, I, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how I know. That's how you know. Well, I keep nine commandments. There's only one commandment that I don't keep. I don't keep the fourth commandment. And people say, you know, all the time to me, they say, well, James, they call me Frankie at the house. Frankie, you can worship on any day. You know, I, I like to call them those uh, all days matters kind of folks. All days matter. You know, all days matter. No, no, no. God's talking about one day. He said his Sabbath, he set aside for you to rest, to worship, to rest from sin, to rest from the cares of this world. He's only asking you to rest in him so that he can take your life to greater heights. I, I, I don't want you to confuse yourself with these all days matter folk. Because, because yes, yes, you can worship any day, but God said, make my hollow, I've hollowed my Sabbath for a reason. 
I want to give you a double portion of my anointing for a reason. Just like that manna that fell from heaven, he gave a double portion on the Sabbath so that we wouldn't have to be tempted to go out and find for ourselves, but, but that God says, I'll provide everything you need. If you do not allow your foot to trample on my Sabbath, I'll give you an abundant life. And I could preach all day and I know that we have more to come. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an appeal right now to you. If you wanna connect with us, I want you to go to our website, HoustonBereanSDA.org. You can cl click on contact us. You can email us at secretary at HoustonBereanSDA.org. Maybe you want a Bible study. Maybe you want to hear more about, uh, about the Sabbath truth. Maybe you want to hear more about how you can become a contagious Christian. Maybe you want to know what we're doing in our community to be a blessing to those within our reach. Join us. Help us. We need your help. We need you to get off the bench and get in the game. We need you. So join us. If this, maybe you heard something for the first time, you said, yes, I want to give God my heart today. I'm asking you to, to, to say a prayer with me right now. And we're going to give our hearts to you, God. And we're not going to go back to business as usual, but we're going to become a contagious Christian. We're going to take our mask off and let people get, uh, get all that you put on the inside of us. Let's pray a word uh, to seal this sermon, and then, we'll, and then I will give the benediction. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you, thank you, thank you, because you're so awesome. And Lord, even though I've been in full retreat, even though I've run away from the task that you've, in, 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 that you've called me and assigned me to, even though I, I've, I've sat down and, and said, let the young folks do it, even though I, I, I've had some, some beef with some folk and said, you know what, to heck with them and that whole church, you know, maybe, maybe I've, been, I've been outside, but Lord, I, I thank you for this word today that reminds me that you still want me to serve with you and bring the world back into relationship to you, Lord. And so, Lord, I thank you for the call on our life. And there's an individual that's listening today who says, you know what, Lord, I want to give you my heart today. I, I want to give you my heart today. I, I want to begin to love you unconditionally so that I can in turn love those around me unconditionally. Lord, you, you, there are some, some immature lambs that I have to teach and lead. There are some mature Christians that need some vision and some guidance. Lord, Lord help me to be an instrument in your hands. Lord, that is our prayer today. Help us to be contagious. Help us to let your gospel message catch fire in the city of Houston. And even though, Lord, we are socially distant, Lord, we know that you can come in and sup with us if we open our hearts to you. So God, we thank you for what you're gonna do in our lives as a result of this preach word. We thank you and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.